And welcome to this segment of Inside Fall River. I'm Steve Kamara, hosting uh, this segment, and my guest is Brian Pearson. Uh, Brian is chairman of the uh, Fall River Bicycle Committee. He's also a member of the Fall River Bicycle Commission, and we'll uh, clarify a little bit about the difference between those two. And he's also a member of something that's uh, growing geographically uh, called the South Coast Bikeway. And and what that's about. And there are many people in Fall River that are in, involved in this, and I'm sure Brian will uh, point out the, uh, the other significant Fall River folks uh, who, who have been involved in, uh, in, in expanding the opportunities for people to use their bicycles. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Brian. Nice to have you uh, back in the studio. Uh, yeah. You're familiar with the studio. You've been here once or twice yeah, a few times. in your lifetime. And thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me on. Very Great. Well, well, I know you're doing a good work, and you keep in touch with us, and we try to keep all the upcoming uh, bicycle events that are happening. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about bicycle safety, because mm -hmm. now that the uh, summer is upon us and the autumn months and kids going back to school in September, uh, there's hopefully going to be more use of bicycles in getting around. And what do people need to know about being safe? Well, it's usually common sense. Uh, you know, you should wear a helmet. If you're 16 years and younger, the law states that you have to wear a helmet in Massachusetts. Uh, but even I recommend to adults, uh, wear a helmet. It's very important. You fall off a bike that's traveling at 10 miles an hour, you could do some uh, damage. So that's one of the basic things. Get a good helmet and wear it. Uh, some of the other bicycle safety tips I tell people is to check your uh, tires before every ride. Uh, you want to make sure the correct pressure is in the tires. Check your chain. Make sure it's not rusting up. Uh, check uh, your handlebars. Uh, all the little things that you should do before you ride. And basically, when you're out on the road, uh, I tell people use common sense, awareness of your situation, where you're located. Always keep your eye out. You're looking as you're uh, traveling. Uh, you should always go with traffic. I, I get very upset when I see people driving against the traffic when they're driving their bicycle. But when you're on the road, go with traffic. Look at uh, cars ahead of you. Uh, you don't want to be what they term doored, somebody opening the door, so you're looking in, in cars. Uh, you're looking at driveways. You're looking at intersections. Don't wear... Uh, not, you know, the uh, music, uh, what are those devices called now? Headsets. Headsets. Any kind, right? Don't wear a headset. You want to be able to hear the traffic, cars and trucks coming up behind you. You want to be aware. So that's a very important thing is awareness. So that's a couple of things uh, when you talk about bicycle safety. It's very common sense and it's easy to do. Now I know that uh in the past, there have been bicycle safety days, and mm -hmm. uh, is, is this an ongoing uh, effort that people are being trained about how to use their bicycles safely, and how about in the schools as well? Is there any effort now to bring that education uh, to the kids through the school systems? We had a gentleman from Mass Bike that came down in April uh, to give a talk to all the phys ed teachers about bicycle safety. He spent about an hour and a half with us, uh, I attended it, and uh, again, he talked about the basics that I just went over, uh, but of course, he did it in more detail. Then in May, we did our first uh, bicycle safety rodeo, and at that event, we gave out helmets to the children. Uh, we set up a little uh, course. Uh, police officer Atkinson was there and teaching the children about bicycle safety. We also had somebody there teaching about uh, the basics of uh, bicycle care. And also we had uh, somebody else there talking about fixing a road flat. So we had different aspects uh, for the children at that event. And we're hoping that's going to be an annual event. Excellent. Now how about in the school system itself? Do principals and teachers get any kind of training to talk to their kids about sp bicycle safety, even if it's not a formalized curriculum, um, at least uh, getting kids tuned into being safer if they take their bikes to school. For I'm instance. not sure about that, but what we did in April, we did do uh, early May, we did do a uh, bike to school day with the Tansy students. Mm -hmm. And we introduced the uh, students to uh, biking. Some of them have never been on the road and it was, it was quite the thing to, uh, have the children ride from, a, we started at North Park, 
all the way to the Tansy School, and many of them really enjoyed it. We also had the Fort River Police Department there, too. Excellent. Uh, well, that's great, and, um, and that gives us uh, some, some focus on, on bicycle safety. Uh, I, too, share with you that concern when I see a bicycle coming at me uh, when I'm driving my car. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that they should be on the other side of the street, mm -hmm. whereas walkers should face the traffic. Right. So if you're walking, you should face the traffic. If you're bicycling, you should flow with the traffic. Right. Um, so how about selecting a bike? Uh, what is, uh, you know, I'm certainly an, an older person, shouldn't be necessarily selecting the same kind of bike as a younger person. How does someone determine what kind of bicycle is right for them? It depends on what you want to do with your bike. Uh, if you want an off-road bike, you definitely have to get the type that has the larger tires, uh, a suspension system. Um, all people of all ages do that uh, off-road. Uh, but again, you have to get the correct bike. If you want to do uh, simple riding, uh, commuting uh, to work, uh, riding on a bike path, a hybrid will probably be good for you. If you want to do Define some... Define a hybrid. What is that? Hybrid is a little uh, in between a road bike, which I'm going to talk about, and maybe some aspects of a mountain bike. It might have some suspension to it. It wouldn't be as uh, low to the ground, as a road bike, it wouldn't be, uh, the tires would be a little thinner than a, uh, than a, a hybrid. Uh, so then if you want to go into riding quicker on the roads, you want to uh, maybe compete or ride with uh, some of the local clubs, uh, you might want to get a road bike where the uh, tires are very thin, the bike weighs a lot less than the hybrid, uh, and you might want to get the clips for the shoes, things like that. So you've got to decide what you want to do. What I've learned is people usually start with a hybrid and then discover road bike, off-road. They buy another bike for that, and then they discover road biking, and they buy it. So I know people who have three, four bikes because they want to do the different type of things. So you want the proper fit, too. And I always recommend go to a local bike shop. There, you're going to get the attention you need. If you go to a big box store, you're going to pick up something that might not fit you. At the bike shop, you're going to get something that's going to be sized just for you. They'll adjust the seats. They're going to adjust the handlebars. They'll tell you the type, the size bike you're going to need. And I get, when I see somebody riding a bike that's way too small for them, they're not going to enjoy the ride. They're going to, their knees are going to hurt. They're not going to be able to ride uh, much of a distance. And they're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to want to do it again. So sure. you really should have a bike that's fitted for you. Yeah, well, I don't want to necessarily promote any single business, but I remember as a youngster uh, on Pleasant Street, and I'm not, I think he may have been on Bedford Street at one time, mm -hmm. was Paul's Cycle Shop. Right. And right. anyone who's old enough to remember Many Paul. Many years ago. <laughs> everyone knew Paul. Anyone and everyone that uh, had a bicycle at one time or another went to see Paul uh, in order to get their bicycle uh, are there locally owned bicycle shops now here in Fall River? None in Fall River, unfortunately. Uh, like you said, I don't want to promote anybody, but if you go uh, Google uh, bicycle stores in, in Massachusetts, it'll give you uh, many bicycle stores in the area. There's some nice ones in, uh, right over the border in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of bicycle shops in the area, but unfortunately not in Fall River. Well, maybe some entrepreneur out there looking for an opportunity to develop yeah. a business might think about that. I, it certainly is a growing, um, there is a growing interest in using bicycles. Yep. I, I think the last bicycle uh, independently owned bicycle shop was on uh, Rhode Island Avenue. I think uh, it was a near, Schwinn. Near the Fall River Shopping yeah. Center. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that would be great if uh, some local entrepreneur might uh, get a bicycle uh, shop opened in town. Um, tell us now a little bit about the committee that you're the chairman of, mm -hmm. uh, the Fall River Bicycle Committee. Uh, how often does it meet? How do people get to know about your sure. meetings? And uh, how does it differ from the Fall River Bicycle Commission? Okay, well, a little history. Two years ago, uh, the uh, committee that, uh, I think it was uh, the POT committee that uh, Sandy Dennis is on, Julie Kelly, who's from Mass in Motion, who has helped us tremendously, they, they uh, decided to, to do a subcommittee on bicycling. So of course that piqued my interest and I went. And from there, the Four of a Bicycle Committee has grown leaps and bounds in two years. It went from a committee that was about five, six members 
now we send out over 100 emails to different individuals. And a meeting, usually about 14 to 16 people show up for the meetings. We meet once a month. It's the first Monday of the month. And we meet at the uh, Good Shepherd on uh, South Main Street. We just started meeting there. So it's at the Good Shepherd. We meet at 6 p.m. Uh, what we do is uh, advocate for bicycle safety in the city. We advocate for bicycle paths. And we hold many rides. Um, when we first started out, four or five people would show up for a ride. We're now doing 12 to 20 people show up for a ride. What we'll do is we'll ride sometime in the city. We held a ride in the North End uh, just recently. We'll ride through the Bioreserve, introduce people from Fall River to the Bioreserve, which is an untapped resource. And we also ride in the local bike paths, like the East Bay, especially to introduce beginners to riding because it's flat, it's easy to ride, and it's beautiful. Uh, the scenery is gorgeous from, from uh, Bristol all the way up to East Providence. And if you so choose, you can go over the Washington Bridge, and which we've done, we go into Indian po Point Park in Providence. Mm -hmm. So it, it's amazing. The other great thing is the exercise. It's great for you. Um, my doctor told me I can't run anymore because of my knees, but he said biking is fantastic. So that's what I do. Great, and how does it differ than, from the commission? Well, once the bicycle committee started getting going, we realized that the city should have an official commission that could look at grants, uh, look at planning, um, work with the planning department. And I approached the uh, mayor, and the mayor thought it was a great idea. And what he did was appoint uh, members to a far of a bicycle commission that meets once a month. I'm not sure of the exact day. I think it's the third or fourth Thursday of the month. And uh, Jim Cusick is the chairman of that. I serve on it. And again, our main purpose is to work with planning, engineering, DPW, signage, bike lanes within the city. And if anyone wanted to know more of about the Bicycle Commission, they could contact the mayor's office? Uh, yes. Would that be an appropriate contact yep. then? And if they want to know more about the Bicycle Committee, they, they can contact, contact you. Right. Okay, and how about uh, the, this new thing that's been established, which is the South Coast Bikeway? And uh, who is a good contact uh, if people want to get connected to a bigger plan, if you will? Well, they could probably contact me or they could probably uh, contact uh, Julie Kelly at City Hall. Uh, like I said, she's with Mass in Motion, and she's very involved in this. And it, the committee is represented. There's no chairman. The committee has representatives from Fall River, Westport, Dartmouth, New Bedford, Wareham, Mattapoisett, and Fairhaven. So you have seven communities. And our goal is to someday connect all those communities, hopefully with a bike path. Well, I know that uh, Julie's uh, spoken of... Uh the plan ultimately to have a bicycle connection from Providence to Provincetown. Right. And it's not so far-fetched, is it? No, not at all. You, you see in, in Rhode Island, Rhode Island's incredible. If anybody wants to look at some beautiful bike paths, I mentioned one, the East Bay, but the other one is the Blackstone River Bikeway. It's also just become a national park. It is gorgeous. And Rhode Island, they're connecting all these bike paths where you could actually ride from Bristol, Rhode Island, all the way to one socket, Rhode Island, by using bike paths and some bike lanes on city streets. Excellent. Well, clearly there's more to be learned, and uh, we're going to bring back uh, Julianne Kelly and maybe you as well, if you're uh, free to come back again. And let's talk about the expanding interest in bicycles here in Fall River. Brian, I want to thank you very much for your participation today in Inside Fall River, and we thank you, uh, our audience, for tuning in, and we look forward to your returning for more insight into Inside Fall River. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wendy Garflip from United Neighbors, and I'm your host today for Inside Fall River. My guest today is Judith Kirkendale. Judith comes from Seven Hills Behavioral Health, and she is the program manager for the Tobacco-Free Community Partnership. Judith, tell me a little bit about the Community Partnership. Well, the Community Partnership is a program funded by the Nas Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program, MTCP, which receives its funds from the Mass Department of Public Health. And what we do is I serve 59 towns and cities in southeastern Massachusetts, and I educate the public about tobacco use and about secondhand smoke 
and about how the tobacco industry targets our youth and um, also about the availability of uh, quit smoking aids for many, many people in the state. Great. The let's, resources that we have. Let's take each thing and break it down. Okay. Tell us a little bit about tobacco use. What are the statistics? Why shouldn't we be using tobacco? Why is it of such concern these days? Okay. Um, well, the smoking rate in Fall River, to begin with, is high. It's 28%. How does that apply to the national average? Uh, I cannot tell you the national average right now, but I can tell you the statewide average sure. is 14%. So that's so a we significant are double. increase. We right? are double. We are 100% higher. Mm -hmm. So we have a serious problem here. We need to reach the youth and educate them about the dangers of tobacco, and we need to reach the adults and help them quit. Mm -hmm. uh, it, as we know, tobacco is the number one cause of um, death and disease in the nation and in the state. And it costs the state uh, one-tenth, 10% of all of our health care bills are tobacco related. So you're saying 10% of the money that the state uses for health care is just because of tobacco related incidents? Absolutely. That's amazing. That's a fact. Um, you mentioned secondhand smoke. Tell us what is secondhand smoke and how does it impact on people? Secondhand smoke uh, scientifically is known as environmental tobacco smoke and it is the smoke that comes from the cigarette that's lit if it's sitting in the ashtray or the smoke that is coming out of the person who is the smoker. Um, it is a class A human carcinogen, and I think most of us have heard the word carcinogen over the years, which is cancer causing, but only 14 uh, class A. And class A is absolutely scientifically known to cause cancer in humans. Uh, we might remember the old saccharin scare mm -hmm. years ago right. where they said, you know, it's going to cause cancer, and then we found out you would have had to drink 78 cases of soda a day to get that much but not so with secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke, even the mi most minute amount of it, can cause death and disease in other people. Uh, children, people who have heart disease, people who have respiratory disease, we absolutely know it can cause heart attack and stroke. Uh, secondhand smoke in other people. So we're very, very concerned. The Surgeon General came out with a report a few years later that anybody can Google, um, and it is very clear that it is, there is no, the Surgeon General is very clear, there is no safe level of exposure, not at all. So even if you're sitting in a different room in the house or your child's in the back seat of the car when you light a cigarette, is that considered secondhand smoke? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Smoke travels uh, like water travels. I like to use the analogy of uh, when you're swimming in the swimming pool and they put the chlorine and the chemicals in, in one end of the pool, you're not getting them at the other end of the pool. That is not right because smoke and water travel. Great. So it's very, very dangerous. I don't care where you are in the building. So you said something very interesting. You said that the tobacco industry targets youth. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, let's take a step back first. Tell me about youth smoking. Is it on the rise? Is it on the decline? We were hoping that it was on the decline and we were seeing it uh, in the youth risk behavior surveys which are done across the state and all of the schools. We were seeing the use of cigarettes going down. It was a wonderful thing. But then we started seeing the use of the other tobacco products going up. On what the do you same mean by other tobacco products? They're single sale cigars, which are flavored. Banana, grape, chocolate, pineapple, all kinds of mango, yummy flavors. You can buy them for anything from 69 cents to $1.50 a piece. They are sold across the region in all of the convenience stores and the pharmacies and uh, except for Fall River, we'll talk about that later. And um, we are very concerned because that's what the youth are smoking. What happened was the tobacco industry knew the taxes were going up when the FDA finally regulated tobacco. They regulated cigarettes with the new tax. They did not regulate cigars with the new tax. So the industry immediately started churning out these really, really cheap products to our kids that they can afford, they can afford 69 cents, they can afford $1.49, it's like a pack of gum or a bag of chips. It's really not expensive. Mm -hmm. And so the industry knows price matters and they need to get these kids addicted. So the sooner they can get these kids smoking these cigars, the sooner those kids are gonna get addicted and graduate to cigarettes. 
What are some of the other tactics that the industry is using to target youth? Well, they're packaged in really colorful packages. And there's uh, blunt wraps, and there's the single cell cigars, and there's little things called snoos that come in a tin that look very, very much like Altoids to the parent or anybody who looks in a backpack. Um, and there are things that look like mints. They're called Arivas. These are dissolvable products. The mints you just put in your mouth and you swallow the nicotine. And that's how you get the nicotine. And what is, how much nicotine are you getting compared to, say, smoking a cigarette from a cigar or from one of these mints? This, the, it's not on the packaging anywhere, so we really don't know. And the FDA is trying to catch up and analyze all these products, but the products are coming out so fast they don't have the wherewithal to do it in a timely manner. So we're, we've been told that sometimes the snooze or the Arivas, the dissolvables, they have as much nicotine in one of those as maybe four to five cigarettes. And what would stop a youth from putting three or four in their mouth and popping them, you know? I've never known anybody to take one Tic Tac at a time, especially right. young people. Right. Yeah, right. and they look like Tic Tacs and they taste like Tic Tacs. Well, let's talk about something positive. Let's oh, talk let's about the do. pharmacy ban in Fall River <laughs> on cigarettes because it's something we're very proud of. A couple of uh, weeks ago, we had the Bold Coalition kids here who talked a little bit about their role in it, and why don't you expand on that? Well, I think it's a year ago now. Mm -hmm. It was April? Yeah, I think so. And we're celebrating a big anniversary because, because of the Bold Youth and the, and the work that went on with the Healthy City Fall River working with the town council, the city council, to pass a regulation to ban the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. It was an arduous discussion. It went on for quite a while, but in the end, it happened. And Fall River was the first community in Southeast Mass, and we're very excited, and we're also happy to say, because they led the way, that now New Bedford did it, Wareham did it, Rochester just passed it, and I don't want to name the other communities, but there are three or four right now that are working on it, right here in southeastern Mass. Now, does this ban cigarettes from all pharmacies? How, how exactly is the statute applied to our community? Yes, in all pharmacies in the community. So you might see a pharmacy in Walmart or in Stop and Shop or in Shaw's. They are not selling tobacco products either. It is just all pharmacies. And it has been a... Um, a real game changer when, you know, because youth walk into pharmacies, children walk in with pharmacies with their parents to buy things to make the family healthy. Or if the family's sick, help the family get better. There's a man or a woman in a white coat in the back of the pharmacy who's giving them prescriptions. There is somebody else taking the blood pressure. All of these pharmacies have these kinds of services. So that naturally, if the student or the young person walks in and sees the tobacco products everywhere, they're to assume right away oh, well, this must not be so bad if right. they're it's selling this. It's tacit approval in some ways. It's tacit approval. Right. That is exactly what it is. Right. And it's confusing to young people. Mm -hmm. And also, when another person is walking in a smoker and they're all ready to quit smoking and they're walking in to get their patches or their gum or their Shantex or their Wellbutrin, they're all excited about it and they walk in and they have to walk back past the product that they really, really want. Mm -hmm. And so many times we believe it's a trigger for those who would rather quit smoking, but they walk into the pharmacy and there's the very product that they're addicted to. We do see lots of change happening. Just mm -hmm. when I pulled into BCC, this uh, program is broadcast at, at Bristol Community College. Oh. There are signs all over the place that you cannot smoke on campus, anywhere on campus. I remember growing up, and even in high school, we had a designated student smoking area. I remember that. So we that. have come a very long way, and it's very nice to hear how the pharmacy ban is really uh, catching on throughout the communities you're working with. It really is. Let's talk secession. Mm -hmm. If you want to stop smoking, how do you do it? I know there's <sighs> a variety of things out there. How do we get the information we need to choose the best way to stop smoking? Well, uh, after the program, there'll be some information that comes up on the screen. Uh, makesmokinghistory.org is our website with a complete quit smoking program on it and with the stories of local smokers from our ex-smoker hall of fame they're up there on that website explaining how they did it why they did it and what does it feel like to be an ex-smoker and what did they use to quit smoking we know that statistically speaking the average smoker takes eight to twelve tries and that's a lot. And Eight so, to 12 times of trying to stop smoking. Right. Is that cold turkey or is that utilizing either a patch or a pill or something like it's, that? Or it's, both? Everything. it's everything. It's everything. Uh, and that our message to the smokers out there, 
77% of the smokers in Massachusetts have answered surveys. They want to quit. They're trying to quit. Of those folks, if they would use the counseling, and our counseling is 1-800-QUIT-NOW, which will be on the screen, and they use the counseling and they use um, either the patch, the gum, or the prescription medication, they have just doubled their chances of a long-term successful quit. Mm -hmm. And that's really a big deal when you're a smoker and you know how many times you've struggled. I'm an ex-smoker and it is very, very difficult to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. So we're so happy that we have these resources. And the big news is that people who are Mass Health members, they are eligible to get those products, the uh, prescription and the patch and the gum and the inhaler, FDA approved products to help people quit smoking, that they only have to pay their usual mass health copay of between, I think it's two or four dollars to get any one of those things. Uh, patches for two weeks cost uh, the average person fifty dollars. It's a wonderful thing to have this free for the Mass Health members. That's terrific. What is the best route to go? Or is it individual? How does someone know? Should I get a patch? Should I take Wellbutin? I mean, how do you know what the best system is for you to use? Therein lies the importance of 1-800-QUIT-NOW because the people who answer the phone are certified tobacco treatment specialists. They're certified through UMass Medical School. They know what they're talking about. They will do an intake over the phone with the individual and they will discuss the alternatives and what works best. Maybe that person's tried one of them and it didn't work. They need to try something else. They need to be told exactly how much uh, to buy. Uh, people go in and buy patches and don't look at the box. There are three different dosages, 21, 14, and seven. If you smoke half a pack a day and you buy a 21 mg box of patches, you're going to make yourself very, very sick. So they should get on the telephone and they should ask for advice from these tobacco treatment specialists because that's what they do all day long. Sounds terrific. So tell us again, if you want to stop smoking, we're going to what website? Makesmokinghistory.org. Great. It's a great website. Right. And the impact on children. Mm. Why, why do we... Are, why are we especially concerned about kids smoking? I know that there's some issues with their brains. You want to talk about that a little? Well, there's so much new brain research that's come out, and the Surgeon General, again, has just come out with a report this year on youth and smoking. And she is very clear that when you use tobacco in the teen years, you are changing the composition, the cellular, cellular composition of the brain. You are changing it so drastically that it sets up the young person for all kinds of addictions, not tobacco. It sets them up for alcohol, it sets them up for drugs, cocaine and other drugs. It changes their brain and that is a very scary thing. So we see the seriousness of this entire topic. If you want more information, we're gonna to go to 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Okay. I'd like to thank you, Judith, for coming on. Tobacco Free Community Partnership, Judith Kirkendall. We know that the information is going to be posted on this site after the program is over. Right. And if you need more information, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. So this is Wendy and Judith from Inside Fall River. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.